My name is Heather Vokush, and thank you very much for joining us. Now, more than 20% of New Yorkers live in poverty, and that number is increasing. But what are the causes, and what are some solutions? So we are delighted to be joined today by Patrick Marquis, who is the Senior Policy Analyst for the Coalition for the Homeless, and Joel Berg, who is the Executive Director of the New York City Coalition Against Hunger. So thank you both very much for having joined us. So um, if we may, let's start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about the current state of homelessness in, in New York? Yes, uh, unfortunately we're, we're living right now through the worst homelessness crisis in New York City since the Great Depression of The worst homelessness crisis? We have more than 51,000 uh, men, women, and children sleeping in New York City's homeless shelter system every night. Uh, mm -hmm. Thousands more sleep on the streets. Mm -hmm. More than three quarters of our homeless population is families and children. Mm -hmm. um, that 51,000 figure, the number of people sleeping in city shelters each night, includes more than 21,000 children. These are the highest numbers since the city began keeping records 30 years ago, the highest numbers of homeless people on a given night since the Great Depression of the 30s. And since Mayor Bloomberg took office nearly 12 years ago, it represents a 61% increase in the total homeless population and a 73% increase in the number of homeless families. Uh, to put these, these numbers kind of even more perspective, while we have 51,000 people in our shelters each night, more than 100,000 different men, women, and children utilize the city shelter system in the course of a year. So more mm -hmm. than 100,000 New Yorkers experience homelessness over the course of a year. Again, record numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and clearly, again, we're living through the, the, the sort of the worst crisis of homelessness since the Great Depression of the 30s with no sign of any change because of the failures of Mayor Bloomberg's policies and because of the worsening affordability crisis in New York. I mean, those are staggering figures. Those are really staggering figures. How mm -hmm. do you deal with that? Well, again, uh, how we got here is really part of the problem and really speaks to the solutions. Mm -hmm. um, Clearly one of the major causes of record homelessness in New York City is the worsening affordability gap that we have in the city, the gap between incomes and rents. Mm -hmm. uh, a recent study just came out and using uh, figures from the Census Bureau found that median rents in New York City, even during the economic downturn that began in 2008 with the, with the financial crisis, even during that period of time, rents in New York City went up uh, at the median by 8%, while incomes at the median of renters went down by nearly 7%. Mm -hmm. So what we've seen is this widening gap between housing costs that are continuing to rise year after year and the incomes of low-income, poor, working-class New Yorkers continuing to fall and at best stagnate. Mm -hmm. And so that gap is where we see homelessness occurring. Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons that we're seeing more and more families becoming homeless. Mm -hmm. uh, the typical homeless family is you know, a working poor family um, about a third of homeless families in our shelter system are actually working, have employment income, uh, but they earn too little to afford apartment rents. And the poorest neighborhoods in New York City, whether it's East New York and Brooklyn or the South Bronx, uh, you have asking rents of $1,000 a month for a two-bedroom apartment, and we're talking about families whose monthly income is about $1,000 a month, mm -hmm. you know, working as home health aides, uh, retail sales jobs. Uh, you know, working in the, as security guards. These are jobs that pay, at best, a little bit above the minimum wage. They just don't pay enough for people to afford housing. So compounding all of these problems, these structural problems that we've seen getting worse in recent years has been the failure of government policy and most particularly the failure of Mayor Bloomberg's approach to the problem of homelessness. Mayor Bloomberg, in fact, took away permanent affordable housing resources from homeless families Previous New York City mayors of both political parties and of every ideological stripe had approached the problem of family homelessness by targeting affordable housing resources to help homeless families move from shelter, from the shelter system into permanent housing. In particular, federal housing programs like public housing and federal housing vouchers, what previous mayors would do is set aside a portion of those federal housing programs to help homeless families and children escape the shelter system and move into permanent housing. Those policies worked very well for many years. Uh, if they didn't eliminate homelessness entirely, they kept homelessness at much lower levels in the city in the 80s and 90s. In contrast, Mayor Bloomberg back in 2005 took away those federal housing programs and other housing resources from homeless families. And for the past few years, we've been living in a situation where literally for the first time since modern homelessness began more than three decades ago, there's no permanent housing assistance to help homeless kids and families move out of the shelter system. Mm -hmm. uh, the result has been 
uh, soaring family homelessness. Homeless families now stay homeless for longer periods of time. Two years ago, the typical homeless family stayed in shelter for nine months. It's now more than 13 and a half months. Mm -hmm. So families and children are experiencing homelessness for longer time, and the, the impact on children has been the most dramatic and the most severe. There's a wealth of academic studies and of firsthand evidence that shows that homelessness is incredibly harmful to children. Mm -hmm. Homeless kids do much worse in school compared to even to other poor kids. Uh, much more severe health problems, developmental delays, respiratory illnesses, mm -hmm. uh, emotional and mental health problems that come as a result of the trauma of homelessness. So we're really inflicting harm mm -hmm. on you know, tens of thousands of children each year in a way that really is preventable. That we could have avoided all of that if Mayor Bloomberg, instead of putting in place these ideological policies that took housing resources away from the neediest children and families mm -hmm. if we had instead done what we know works to solve this problem. And you said roughly 21,000 kids who are homeless Each of the, the 51,000. And more than 40,000 a year Which is so egregiously homes. unacceptable in a country in which, you know, we certainly would have enough money, you know, Absolutely. in order to house those kids. Now you mentioned an interesting point and that's the whole ideological part, you know, I, I guess some people think that society is responsible and some people think the individual is responsible. Is this what you think is the problem with Bloomberg's approach? Yeah, very much so. I mean, uh, the Bloomberg administration, like its predecessor, the Giuliani administration, had a, an ideological approach to these issues of poverty and homelessness, which was very much a sort of blame the victim approach. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what we've called a behaviorist kind of approach to the problem. Mm -hmm. they, they sort of view the problem as that homeless people are homeless because it's their own fault. They made mistakes, they made bad choices, mm -hmm. they did something wrong. And the consequence of that is that they uh, not only don't address the problem with the housing-based solutions that we know work to solve the problem, and, mm -hmm. and that are supported by a wealth of academic research and, and evidence that these are the things that really work to reduce family homelessness. Mm -hmm. uh, not only has the Bloomberg administration not done that, but mm -hmm. they've instead chosen a series of punitive policies uh, as their way of dealing with the problem of homelessness. So what do I mean by that? Uh, they've tried to undermine the legal right to shelter, which exists for homeless children and families and individuals in New York City. New York mm -hmm. City is the only city in the United States that has this fundamental protection for homeless people. Uh, they've tried to charge rent to homeless families uh, who are in the shelter system. They wanted to charge as much as $900 a month uh, for a homeless family to pay rent for just temporary shelter. Uh, a whole series of policies really designed to just kind of make the lives of homeless people and homeless kids much harder instead of the housing-based solutions that would really work to solve the problem. I, and the even crazier part of all this is that the Bloomberg administration's approach to this problem is much more expensive to the taxpayer. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a study that was done by budget analysts at the city's independent budget office last mm -hmm. year that if the city were to return to the policy of prioritizing homeless families and kids for uh, federal public housing apartments, which was the policy under Mayors Koch, Dinkins, and Giuliani. Mm -hmm. uh, if we did that, we would not only reduce uh, child and family homelessness in New York City, but we would save nearly $15 million that's being spent each year on the city shelter system. Mm -hmm. It costs more than $37,000 a year to shelter a homeless family. Uh -huh. And the cost of th that cost, an incredible cost, $3,000 a month or more, uh, is balance that against permanent housing programs, which might cost a fraction of that, $10,000 a month for a federal housing voucher. And you can really see the, the sort of fiscal lunacy of this policy as well as the, the, the real harm that it inflicts on families. And it's also really quite ugly when you think of the economic inequity and how some people are probably spending 37000 a month for rent, you, yes. know, <laughs> you know, and it's no big deal, you know. And yeah, I mean, so uh, you know, well, all the time, uh, homeless families, and we're talking to them all the time, are saying to us, you know, well, you, they're paying $3,000 a month to keep me in this, you know, rundown shelter. Mm -hmm. uh, I could be paying that much for an apartment on, you know, Park Avenue or something like that. And, and they're right. And why is, the, why is the city taxpayer doing that? Why are we, uh, we as taxpayers, paying that kind of money for a temporary uh, Band-Aid solution when there mm -hmm. are permanent solutions which are actually cheaper? So can you, can you tell us what public policies would you like to see enacted? Yeah, I mean, we've obviously, you know, this being a, a, an election year in New York City, we're, first of all, very hopeful that we see a change, uh, a change in the approach to homelessness and poverty under a new mayor. Mm -hmm. um, so far, we've been hearing some positive things from many of the candidates uh, for mayor, and so we're, we're real hopeful about uh, the prospects of change. Uh, most of all, we want to see, uh, in the short term, the mayor 
the new mayor, return to the policy of targeting existing affordable housing resources to help the neediest children and families. And that mm -hmm. means prioritizing uh, public housing apartments and federal housing vouchers uh, for homeless families, as was the, the policy under previous New York City mayors. Secondly, under the city's housing development program, uh, we'd like to see more of an emphasis on housing for specifically set aside for homeless people uh, as well as for poor people. Mm -hmm. Mayor Koch, when, uh, you know, when he passed away uh, this past year, was l justly lauded for his 10-year uh, housing plan, which uh, built or rehabbed 150,000 apartments in New York City. What people forget is that 10% of all of those apartments that were created under the Koch housing plan went to homeless families and, and individuals. Mm -hmm. More than 60% of the housing created under that plan went to very low-income New Yorkers. In okay. contrast, Mayor Bloomberg's housing plan, <laughs> only 4% of the housing units go to the homeless and only about a third of the housing units go to the poorest New Yorkers. So we need to definitely like go back to kind of the model that we saw in the Koch plan, but accepting the fact that we've got bigger problems. And then finally, the city ought to be uh, partnering with the state to create uh, a new rental assistance program, but one that's modeled on federal housing vouchers, mm -hmm. which works so well. Uh, and not on some of the, the failed rent subsidy programs that we saw under the Bloomberg administration. We think that the, and the next mayor can definitely do that and that mm -hmm. there's, there's going to be real receptivity in Albany to doing that. Finally, a lot of these punitive policies which have made it harder for children and families uh, and individuals to get into shelter, mm -hmm. uh, which has turned, literally closed the shelter door on very many vulnerable people, we need to get rid of those kinds of policies mm -hmm. uh, and do that very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so we've outlined a lot of these reforms in our our annual State of the Homeless report, uh, which also is a, is a very close look at kind of the failed policies of the Bloomberg administration. But we conclude the report by sort of outlining some steps that the next mayor can, can take to, to get us out of this mess. So this next election is very, very important. And we would encourage everybody to think in terms of homelessness and also hunger when casting your vote, clearly. Mm -hmm. So just one more question for sure. you. Um, with your group and your web and the web side that goes with it, the Coalition for the Homeless. What is it that people in the community can do to support the work that you do? Well, we, we certainly welcome anybody. First of all, we ask people to visit our website. It's coalitionforthehomeless.org. Mm -hmm. um, you can get a lot of information about homelessness in New York City, but also about our direct services programs. Although we're best known as an advocacy and public policy group, we have 12 direct service programs that help more than 3,000 homeless and low-income New Yorkers each day everything from feeding homeless people on the streets to job training uh, to a summer camp for homeless kids, an after-school program, and permanent housing programs. Um, we also are always welcome donations, obviously, from folks to help us continue to do our work, uh, and volunteers. Mm -hmm. our, our emergency feeding program, which are uh, vans that go out and feed people on the streets every night of the year, is almost completely run by volunteers, mm -hmm. um, and we're always looking for, for help from people. Okay, good. So we've got the Coalition for the Homeless, and thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And now we will turn to you. We just heard some very interesting statistics and some very horrifying information from Patrick Marquis, but I'm assuming um, Joel Berg, who, and you are the executive director of the New York City Coalition Against Hunger, I'm assuming that there are some overlaps in the work that you do and some similar challenges. Can you tell us about your work? There is a lot of overlap. The people who are homeless tend to be the most hungry, the most food insecure in mm -hmm. the city. But your viewers should understand that the homeless population is a very, very, very small subsection of who is uh, hungry, a very small subset of who's hungry. The people you see on the street uh, panhandling are a small subsection of who's homeless, and who's homeless is, again, a very small percentage of who's hungry. So as Patrick mm -hmm. said, there are about 50,000 people sleeping in shelters. Mm -hmm. The number of people who are food insecure and hungry in the city is about 1.4 million. 1 it's about million. one in six New York City residents. Mm -hmm. And the number of children in those households is about a half a million children. Mm -hmm. One in five mm -hmm. New York City children live in homes that can't afford enough food. Now, this isn't Somalia or North Korea. Mm -hmm. Kids aren't starving in the streets because we do have some safety net programs, but mm -hmm. we have a worse problem than any industrialized Western nation on the planet and is a devastating problem. People choosing between food and rent, people choosing between food and health care. The greatest 
dying of all because hungry people mm -hmm. can't afford the healthiest food. Sometimes hunger and right. obesity actually are flip sides right. of the same malnutrition coin. Mm -hmm. uh, it's devastating our economy, devastating our health, devastating our educational performance. Mm -hmm. And this is a city that has 53 billionaires with a net worth of uh, $230 billion. So it's particularly galling mm -hmm. that we have such ridiculously high levels of hunger and homelessness. And to have that level of food insecurity again, you know, in a country with so much money is just insane. Look, America and New York almost ended hunger entirely in the 1970s mm -hmm. because we had living wage jobs and a more robust safety net. We've gone backwards in mm -hmm. the decades since. Mm -hmm. And part of it is that our nation has created the myth that mm -hmm. somehow we can solve major pressing social problems with a little more charity. Instead of getting homeless people homes, we'll, we'll be happy we'll donate a coat to them once a mm -hmm. year. Instead of getting hungry people living wage jobs or mm -hmm. true access to a government safety net, we'll give them some extra cans once a year. Mm -hmm. I ask people to think about this. If your own grandmother couldn't afford prescription drugs, would you ask people in the neighborhood to do a prescription drug drive? Would you ask them to go into their medicine cabinet and donate the extra medicine they think <laughs> your grandmother needs? Of course you wouldn't. Right. There's no way you would. Yeah. And the fact that we basically do that for food shows you that, honestly, as a society, we're not really thinking very hard about the, the needs of low-income families. We're thinking about what's easy for us, not mm -hmm. what's not what's in the interest of low-income people. Because if we thought about low-income people as if they were our own family, there's no way we treat them the way the society is treating them today. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to that whole ideological thing that we were talking about before with, is it society's you know, fault or is it just the individual should pull him or herself up by the bootstraps? Well, it's, this is the mentality. Yeah, I, I deeply believe in personal responsibility. People should do everything they can to get and keep employment. But what the right won't admit and the media often doesn't cover is the fact that low-income people are doing the responsible thing for mm -hmm. all the demonizing in some corners of the food stamp program. The vast majority of people on this program, now called the SNAP program, are senior citizens, children, working parents, and veterans. The people have done everything mm -hmm. our society has told them to do. They're still poor. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is the SNAP food stamps program actually rewards work. It helps people stay off of cash welfare because it makes work pay. And I challenge my conservative friends or adversaries, if you're against government benefits, if you're against food stamps, if you're against SNAP, as it's now called, then I challenge you to support an increase in the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't cost a penny mm -hmm. of government spending. We could dramatically decrease hunger in America if we really got a serious living wage in this country of, let's say, $15 an hour. Mm -hmm. Our economy can definitely handle it. Lots of our competitive nations are paying far higher wages than us and doing just fine in the competition. Let's get serious about these problems. So what do you think is going to happen when this food stamp program is changed? Well, this November 1st, mm -hmm. every SNAP food stamps recipient in America is going to have a reduction in their benefits. A family of three is going to lose thirty to fifty dollars a month, and I'm That's not even, and I'm not even talking about the cuts proposed by the Senate and the House. I'm talking about plans already in mm -hmm. place because mm -hmm. of a deal made years ago. Mm -hmm. And for the last few years, things have gone from bad to worse. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say this: it's not proper English, but it's true. Things are going to go from worse to worser. Mm -hmm. And you know, many of us Americans who grew up on Frank Capra movies mm -hmm. that you know yeah. uh, have this touching happy ending. Mm -hmm. You know, the banker feels guilty in the end and, you know, throws in his money. Everyone mm -hmm. in the town pinches, you know, pitches mm -hmm. together and somehow they solve the problem. And we're all sort of inculcated into thinking, oh, well, this is America. There's going to be a happy ending. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's just not true. For low-income people, there is no Frank Capra-esque Mm -hmm. happy ending, there's usually more suffering. The only way we prevent the suffering is banding together as citizens, banding together as New Yorkers and Americans, and fighting back. Getting our elected officials to do the right thing. Build an economy with living wage jobs. Create a safety net that stops treating poor people like criminals, even as we're giving out an orgy of corporate welfare to the mm -hmm. millionaires and billionaires without blinking an eyelash. So you got 1.4 million people who have food insecurity in New York City alone, and then you've got this big cuts in the, in the food stamp program, what can be done? 
people can contact their elected officials. Okay. Senator Gillibrand, the U.S. Senator from New York, has been a true champion on these issues, but okay. she's lost uh, these fights to date. I'd urge everyone to call her and thank her. Call the Capitol switchboard. Okay. 202 224 uh, 2124. I, I may have messed it up. Uh, <laughs> we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll Google. Google. I used to know <laughs> it. Uh, I'm, okay, getting, call I'm the losing these numbers in my. Call the switchboard. I'll, I'll call, call the Capitol switchboard. You mm -hmm. can go to our website at www.nyccah.org. Mm -hmm. New York City Coalition Against Hunger mm -hmm. org, mm -hmm. and you can uh, find phone numbers and contact information for uh, Senator Gilbert. Also, call Senator Schumer and ask him to be a leader on these issues. And mm -hmm. find your member of the U.S. House of Representatives who represents you in Washington and Congress, and tell them to oppose these cuts. A lot of Americans don't believe their calls matter. That's just not true. The mm -hmm. only way these folks get to keep their jobs is responding to the people who elected them. The powers that be, the money interests, want people to believe their calls don't matter. They want people to give up. They revel <laughs> in apathy of the masses because that's how they can get away with this. But the truth is that citizen action matters. It mm -hmm. works. It always has, always will. And we have a website, www.hungervolunteer.org, okay. that gives people concrete tools on how to best volunteer to fight hunger. But one of the things we say is one of the most effective things you can do is to engage in policy advocacy. The mm -hmm. truth is five minutes contacting your elected officials can do more than five months serving soup to really turn the situation situation around. Okay, okay, so then possibly similar to, to Patrick, you would be wanting uh, policy advocacy, maybe some donations? Yes, uh, we, we you know, always need donations. A lot of people want to donate food, but I got to tell you, it's far, far, far more efficient to mm -hmm. donate money. Okay. Uh, we help people access SNAP benefits, which dwarf uh, you know, charitable bill benefits for mm -hmm. a year. We help kids access a school breakfast and, and, and summer meals. Mm -hmm. And by giving your money to us to be able to do that, that's far more effective than just bringing us a can that low-income people may or may not use or certainly someone's old pie mix that they haven't used in the last decade. <laughs> and are you interested in having volunteers? We are. As I said, people can go to hungervolunteer.org mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and really learn that showing up with 50 people on Thanksgiving or Christmas is not the answer. You can feel even better about about yourself and get even more done by volunteering in February, in August, when there are far fewer volunteers. You can be even more effective serving on the board of a nonprofit organization. You can help uh, families access federal nutrition assistance benefits. You can mm -hmm. help with a community garden. And you can engage in policy advocacy. You can find out through hungervolunteer.org how to not only act with your heart, but act with your head. Mm -hmm. And not only be compassionate, but be effective in the fight against hunger. I think that, you know, it, it really feels like a class war in, in, in a sense, but now everybody's focused on, oh, what's going to happen with Syria? And so we are trained into thinking that the war is somehow over there. But when you've got 1.4 million New Yorkers, yeah. you know, hungry, and you've got 51,000 that don't have a place to live, and it's getting worse and worse, it really does feel something like a, a war from within. You know, we don't take a stand on, on military matters, but I will just point out as a, a factual matter, a, a cruise missile uh, used an attack, and many of these attacks use numerous cruise mm -hmm. missiles, but just one cruise missile costs about $1.4 million, a Tomahawk cruise missile. Mm -hmm. And now the average food stamps allotment per meal is about $1.40. And so the, the easy math is mm -hmm. one cruise missile equals a million meals, a million meals for right. families on the food stamps NAP pro. Now, talk about class warfare. You know, Mayor Bloomberg recently said that one of the candidates for mayor was engaged in class warfare. I want to be crystal clear. The New York City Coalition Against Hunger is a nonpartisan group. We mm -hmm. don't get involved in campaigns. We don't endorse candidates. Mm -hmm. So what I'm about to say doesn't endorse or oppose any mm -hmm. candidate. But the fact of the matter is the only people who raise the claim class warfare are those who've already fought it and won it. <laughs> uh, the, the, the truth of the matter mm -hmm. is the very wealthiest gaming the system, not mm -hmm. just by happenstance, not just by luck, not just by hard work, by mm -hmm. gaming the system, mm -hmm. have made themselves very, very, very much wealthier mm -hmm. using public policy. Mm -hmm. Calling attention to reality isn't class welfare, mm -hmm. warfare. That is democracy.
You can't say every time someone brings up legitimate racial divisions, mm -hmm. it's racism. No more than you can say anyone who brings up realities of inequality is somehow engaging in class warfare. That's exactly. the game they play to dismiss this. Let's get real. Let's be adult about this and discuss the fact that it is government policies mm -hmm. that are giving ever bigger corporate welfare, ever bigger, bigger tax cuts to mm -hmm. the wealthy while shafting everyone else. You mm -hmm. know, we talk about people needing SNAP being dependent. You know, I ride a plane occasionally, a plane with maybe 200, 300 people on it. Mm -hmm. When Donald Trump rides a plane with one person on it, he gets the same help from government air traffic controllers I do. Exactly. But he gets two to 300 times the help. So let's be real and look at the fact mm -hmm. that the wealthiest in our society take much more out of our tax dollars than poor people ever do. Exactly. Now, just in closing, we've got just a couple of minutes left. You have written a seminal book on hunger. So All You Can Eat, How Hungry Is America? This came out in 2000. Yes. Can you give us just a little bit of information? Do you think things have gotten better or uh, worse? Unfortunately, things have gotten much worse since 2008. Okay. The main thesis of the book is we almost ended hunger entirely in the 1970s by having safety net programs and living wage jobs. We can end it again, but not if we con ourselves with the myth that underfunded, undercoordinated private charities can do the job that the economy needs to do mm -hmm. and our government programs need to do. So it is available on Amazon, it mm -hmm. is available on Kindle, and it is available mm -hmm. at your better public libraries. And then clear Clearly, it is relevant for what is going on today. I mean, there's no question about that. Well, we can't thank you enough for having shared your wisdom with us as Patrick Marquis. And we would very much encourage you with this election that's coming up to keep issues of hunger and homelessness and poverty in your mind when you're picking your candidates. And also, we highly encourage you to visit the website of both of our guests and um, donate, get involved. Just do what you can because, again, it takes a community. So we thank you so much for having joined us, and thank you for having joined us as well. Thank you. Thank you.